All right, we are talking about the Ken Selection of Religion today. This is by Chris Crespi, 2016. And it is largely, I see it as an extension of the logic of Cohen Palmer. And Crespi's very upfront about that, that he's just combining some ideas from other people. Um, so let's review that, and then we'll get into Crespi. The short story is that we're trying to explain um, altruism, uh, morality, and religion. And Crespi uh, is a lot more focused on religion than Cohen Palmer are, per se. All right, so this is... Uh, they're presenting a kin selection theory or in an inclusive fitness theory of altruism and morality. And the short story of that is that in adopting this approach to tradition, uh, so contained in traditional society and traditional morality, it is a way of helping relatives. And the point we'll get to today with Crespi is that religion has a way of providing an enforcement mechanism to make sure everybody cooperates like they're supposed to. But the basic logic um, extends Hamilton's work on inclusive fitness. Okay, and in particular, they talk about the parent-offspring conflict. And that's the deal where if you have a parent and two offspring, um, the offspring are related to themselves in full, in other words, they're fully in um, accordance with their genetic heritage, but they only share 0.5 with mom or dad and 0.5 with each other. And so there's a tendency for offspring to be selfish. I know this comes as a shock to most of you that you never had conflict with your brothers or sisters. Um, but um, the way parents respond to this conflict is they try to get the youngins, um, the offspring, to cooperate more than it is naturally in the offspring's interest to cooperate. And they have this um, rule that you're supposed to obey the parent. And they have all these ways to get you to obey the parent by telling these stories about what happened to kids who didn't obey their parents. See Hansel and Gretel etc etc and then it gets ramped up when it becomes a program when obeying parents is extended backwards that there are these people that were elders and these people died and they became ancestors and the ancestors are the ones that understand everything and so you get this meta manipulation where you get this self propagating program set up where you're supposed to obey parents and then obey ancestors, and you're supposed to teach your children to obey the ancestors and to never question the ancestors. So you have this mechanism um, that's perpetuating obedience that is going back here and addressing the parent-offspring conflict and getting more cooperation than you would by pure genetic, fish, fish, genetic relatedness coefficients by themselves. All right. And then, so if you want to know what are the themes that come up in traditional morality, the things that get specified, it's all stuff, uh, it tends to be these things, and all these, this should make sense, tie back into reproductive fitness. So the importance of motherhood, regulations around mate choice in marriage. So for example, it's likely they want you to marry people, they're going to keep you within the Ken network. Respect for ancestors and elders. Don't talk back, and moreover, don't reject the religion of your elders. And then specifying this altruism towards kin, and especially distant kin, so you can have a kin network with some depth. All right, so in all this, I just have a reminder here. It's lots of moving parts and whatnot, but the key thing is that traditional morality, this idea that you should obey your parents and be a good boy or a good girl. That's a strategy for reproductive fitness. It's not just um, a way we do things. It's a strategy. Okay, so Crespi comes along and wants to extend this framework to religion. So I'm gonna run through a few of his points here and then we'll go into some more detail on some of his other points. 
So one of the key things that Crespi suggests is that parents don't want their genes interfering with each other. They don't want different copies of their genes interfering. So if you think about the, the lineage, which is represented over here, um, what they're trying to do is say that, so each parent is going to have offspring and those offspring are going to have offspring and those offspring are going to have offspring. Well, there's copies of the ancestors genetic material here. But let's say if the blue side here goes to war with the blue side here, or this yellow group aligns with some other group against these um, different lineages, these sub lineages, there's going to be conflict and those genes are going to be competing. What would work a lot better from the ancestors point of view, if they all these descendants recognize this common ancestor and all these folks try to get along so that each one helps the other so that they together can maximize the genetic fitness of the ancestor. So their ancestors want everybody to play on the same team and religion's going to help them do that. Okay, so Crispy is also saying that um, there's this between group competition that occurs and that could be warfare or it could be implicit competition for territory or, or whatnot. Um, but that that is going to select for within group unity and cooperation. In other words, those groups that can cooperate better internally, they're going to get along better and they're going to outcompete other groups. Now, the dark side is this, is the other groups may not even be recognized as humans. They might be treated like a different species. So um, what you have here, and this is just a fascinating way of expressing this, that the idea of worshiping ancestors, what it does, it takes the fundamental relationship between parent and child and transposes that onto the religious plane. So re uh, evolution is always recycling what it already has. It can only build on what it has. So the upshot of this is if you want to understand religion and politics, you need to understand the power difference and the relationship between parent and child. Okay, so religion, another way of thinking about it is that it's a cultural survival vehicle. It's a way that ensures that that culture can survive. Not just the individuals can survive, but that collective as a whole can survive. And Crespi also points to totemism as one of the basic religious structures you'll see around the world. And so most, to simplify that, you're talking about it's a shared lineage, the idea that we're all kin and we come from a shared ancestor, and it gets represented symbolically. So uh, with your totem pole, it tells a story of your clan or your lineage, and there's an animal symbol that represents it. But we see symbols representing lineages all over, or, um, you know, so you go to Winthrop and you're going to become a Winthrop Eagle and that's going to be part of your heritage. You always refer back to that. Back in the day, families had had crests that were like their shield and their family symbol and whatnot. Um, so we, we are very used to using symbols to represent um, groups of kin or pseudo kin. Okay, so going to dig into some of Crespi's points in a little more detail. This is just an overview of those that we'll go into. Um, the idea here, just to hit these quickly, is that um, religion builds on pre-existing structures. Um, it takes advantages of um, previous evolutionary adaptations. It's intimately tied into kinship. And um, what you have from this is the idea that So we have the idea of we're going to respect our elders um, and then that eventually transmutates into um, appreciation for the supernatural. Uh, religion is supercharging cooperation. It aids intergroup competition and there's also resistance to it. The kids fight back. Okay, so one key point is that religion builds on pre-existing capacities. So psychology is very interested in a lot of these capacities because these are all evolved um, pieces of psychology. So this idea that we can all focus on the same thing, this empathetic connection we have, these mirror neurons that enable um, enduring social relationships. You can't have ancestor worship until you can have mother-child bonding and 
um, family bonding, um, this idea of theory of mind. And that's where, because I have a mind, I assume that there's other minds out there. And I can imagine that there's this thing called God or ancestors that are continuing to exist and having an influence just like, and have a mind just like I have a mind. You can infer the purpose of events and use imagination to do that. And there's a process of social learning. You don't have to experience something yourself. You can be told about the ancestors and learn that way. And then language, we have to be able to talk about and flesh out the image of the supernatural before we can believe in it. Okay. Number two, kinship um, is intimately tied up with our conception of the good. So another way of saying that is it's hard for us even to consider what the good is without considering kinship. And so this is from another source, but Fisk talks about this. And this is just amazing, the number of words that go back to this root gen. And, you know, sometimes when things get um, passed down, there's slight changes. So you go from gen to ken. But gen is the root where you get kind, kindness, and kin. So if you think about it, our conception of a kind person, that's somebody that we share kinship with. Um, or the kind of a person somebody is, whether they are kind or not, that's all goes back to a kinship view of the world. And then you have all these other things that come along, generous, generative, gentle, genuine, nation, native, all these are tied back into the same cognate of, of that root. And what it's saying, this is just a beautiful way he says this. Um, so the essence of communal sharing is a relationship based on duties and sentiments generating kindness and generosity among people conceived to be of the same kind. So it's beautiful in one sense. It's also a little scary in the other sense in that it's suggesting that the idea of universal love is not really what we're built for, or at least it's not where we come from. So we think about the love of kinship is natural, genuine, spontaneous, all that kind of stuff, because we have this common blood or, or some other thing that ties us together. So this suggestion of that is that the idea that God growing out of this is going to tend to be one based on kinship, because you got all this other values tied to it. And it's also suggests that God might be a bit parochial. So in other words, interested in our certain kin network and maybe takes our side versus the gods of other people. Remember, Crespi sees this as religion as enabling between group competition. Okay, and this is a um, fascinating kind of perspective. Uh, this isn't in your reading, but I, I pulled it from another Crespi reading where he's citing this other guy, this other evolutionist. But this is working through just the kind of doing the math, how you go from elder respect to supernatural powers. Okay, so this guy's saying, I suggest the crucial step was just this subtle psychological slide. So instead of saying grandfather would have wanted you to do this, we say grandfather wants you to do this. So imagining that that person's still alive. So if, for example, it's not hard to think about people that go to the, the grave of a loved one and, and talk to them. Um, and in their daily life, they, they are so used to talking to that person that they continue to talk to them, even though they're dead. Um, so he's suggesting that it's not a huge stretch to see how that could come about. And then that that is going to um, further strengthen the community, because now these traditional rules are referencing a past leader that to some extent is now superhuman and has powers um, beyond a mere mortal. Um, so this, this is maybe a silly example of this, but in Star Wars, <laughs> when Ben Kenobi tells Darth Vader, you strike me down, I'll become more powerful than you can imagine. Um, that has happened back into this idea that, you know, leaders um, move on and become uh, forces after they die. Okay, so this guy's arguing that original has, has not co-opted moral norms but rather moral norms themselves brought about the evolution of religion. Okay, and another feature that makes the supernatural stuff work well, it's incorruptible. Um, 
So you might strive to have different kinds of laws about what's right and what's wrong, but the mere possibility that they can be corrupted, that somebody can enforce a law because it's to their advantage, right? Or they're going to enforce a law that favors their side of the family or whatever. Uh, if God and the rules of God are beyond space and time, and they're set in stone, think the Ten Commandments being written on stone, they're hollowed, divine, they're sacrosept, sacrosanct. In other words, they're incorruptible because they're taken outside of our regular the give and push, push and shove of um, social interactions. So that's another way in which that um, supernaturalism makes these rules for cooperation even more potent. All right, so going on that theme there, religion supercharges cooperation. So if you stop and think about it, why is re, uh, cooperation based on religion so powerful? Well, the, in the most simple terms, what Crespi is saying is you're combining morality with the supernatural. So if morality is you're supposed to obey your parents and take care of Ken, remember that's the kind of foundation of morality, how do you get it so people don't cheat so that you can actually help each other so you don't have free riding loafers well think about it if it's supernatural you can't question if you come along and question the roots of morality you're you're impugning the whole group's identity um back in the day if you were a protestant say in the early days of the protestant revolution you could be burned at the stake for heresy you can't reject these truths without rejecting the very community that you come from. You can't evade. So um, God is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent. Um, a supernatural force can always look into your heart and know what's in your heart. So there's no way to um, get away from stuff. The enforcement is very low cost. People have to police themselves via conscience. And remember, um, Crespi and others, are accepting the argument that conscience largely comes out of that parent offspring conflict and conscience is the instilled voice of the parent now i hesitate to even mention this but that's not a far throw from the way freud thought about the superego so freud wasn't entirely crazy but that conscience is kind of this foreign thing that gets woven into the depths of your brain that keeps you with the program all right and then supernatural stuff can also be engaging and memorable. If you can have a flood, you get Noah's Ark and you get all kinds of animals. That's fun. Um, if you have people getting raised from the dead, there's all kinds of great stories. Think about the conquest stories in the Old Testament or the miracles of Jesus or what have you. Um, or I think about, you know, some of the multi-limbed um, deities of Hinduism. Uh, there's a a lot of stuff you can do with your imagination there. Um, and then the divine is also very flexible. So I often think about like people that believe in a certain thing is supposed to happen on a certain date and it doesn't happen. And a lot of people just double down on that belief. So if you look in the Old Testament, um, God's supposed to protect his people. Well, what if the people get defeated? Well, then they reinterpret that and they say, well, that's God's punishing us. We must have been, we must have not been good enough and this is the reason god let us lose so these are some reasons why that cooperation is so effective the cooperation induced by religion okay and then religion also aids in intergroup competition so god is often the power that looks over a certain group gods apparently began as tribal gods this is from alexander 2006 um and it's unfortunate that they have never ceased being such. Even if we have particular religions, in effect, large and sometimes fragmented tribes have become huge and widely distributed. That is, God was and still is a way of winning by promoting a particular kind of collective good feeling that makes a group more formidable force against threatening or competitive human groups. So in other words, there's something about God as being um, our God our God is going to take care of us. So you think about the covenant in the Old Testament and the New Testament, those people that believe in Jesus are going to be separated from them, those that don't believe. Um, and the conception of the Israelites, of 
Israel, the nation of Israel as God's chosen people. So a lot of the, the roots of religion are, in, since they're in kinship networks, they're necessarily parochial or um, limited to that group, which can obviously cause some problems because you're going to have different conceptions of God button heads with each other. So you might think that the world can kind of harmonize this stuff and reach a shared understanding of, of what God is. But um, this is, again, Alexander. He's suggesting what is more likely to happen is you have these larger and larger networks believing in the same God. Um, but it's more dangerous because people realize that their conceptions of God are not the same. And so I, here I think about the difference between the West um, which is largely Christian dumb and, or Judeo-Christian and Islam. Um, and that there's a conception that, um, among some folks on either side that either Islam's a wicked religion or that the West is a bunch of infidels. And, um, it's unlikely that we're going to agree on a concept of God there that makes everybody happy. Okay. And then this is an important point, but there is genetic variability in how religious people are and Crespi's coming along and making the point that you're going to get some um, there's going to be pressure for kids offspring to resist some of this indoctrination so at the small scale he's saying mothers are selected to inculcate children with pro-social religious belief um, and their children are selected that's what he's saying in other words when he says that kind of phrasing means um, the gene, the natural selection will reward them if they at least partially and conditionally resist. So in other words, if you um, are willing to um, not give your brother or sister everything and be a little bit selfish, that there's some ways in which that's going to get revo rewarded in the long run. Uh, in the same way, if just imagine if you would do whatever your parents asks without resistance, there might be ways in which your parents would get you to do more chores than really worth your time. So I'll think about just as an aside, but like with my son, like what, to what extent should I have him be doing chores and to what extent should he be doing his homework? And there's oftentimes there's kind of an implicit trade off there in terms of what benefits me and what's going to benefit him in the long run. Okay, but there's these powerful asymmetries. So in other words, parents have a lot more power. And this is Crespi in an earlier piece with Summers, um, arguing that they are very likely, mothers and parents are very likely to get more conformity and good behavior out of the children than would be in the children's narrowly defined self-interest. So it's not unlikely that they're going to be able to manipulate the children. So just a quick aside, one thing that happens is parents can recruit um, older siblings to take care of younger siblings. And at the extremes of that, you might have a female um, that's recruited to delay marrying so that she can stay home and help out with the house or the female that is required to take care of the parents in old age. And maybe some of that offspring's investment from a selfish perspective would rather be, whether she, she might prefer other things being equal to spend that on producing her own children as opposed to taking care of her parents. So, so that's some of the ways in which the parent manipulation can, can take place. All right. We are going to now, um, dive into some applications and extensions. I'm just going to suggest that whoom, we're going to go into some new and exciting stuff here. Okay, so just to throw out some examples, some varieties of religious experience. I think one thing to keep in mind is that religion is a multifaceted, you know, very um, complex uh, phenomenon. And you can get... Um, it might start off as ancestor worship, but it can develop a bunch of other layers and have other components to it. In other words, 
um, Christianity today is by no means like what the first kinds of religions were, but I think you can still see some similarities. Okay, so just to point out a few things, if you look in some parts of the Old Testament and the older parts of the Old Testament, um, you see the God of Israel, Yahweh, as being a God that is all about helping Israel smite its enemies. And very much God is um, partial um, to Israel and is not um, in any way a universal God. It's a warrior God that helps a certain group. Um, so that's one way you can see kinship working there. Um, in voodoo, um, you have a lot of worship of ancestors. Um, I'm going to jump down. To, I'll come back to Confucianism. Um, Christianity, um, you can see a lot of kinship woven through there. So God the Father, Son of God, Mary being the mother of Jesus. The birth of Jesus has a really strong um, kinship narrative with, you know, but portrayed in by children and all kinds of um, Christmas pageants. Um, the kingdom of heaven is a place where the kin go, right? The king is the leader of the kin. So there's a bunch of um, stuff here. You talk about um, brothers and sisters in Christ. There's this language that tries to make everyone in Christianity part of the same kin group. And then um, Confucianism is somewhat perplexing in that it takes the place of a religion um, in some Eastern traditions, but it doesn't have the same kind of concept of God. Well, if you approach it from the ancestor worship condition or, or perspective, then it makes complete sense. So I'm going to pause for a second here and play a short video for you that um, unpacks. The heart of Confucian philosophy is that you understand your place within the hierarchy of the universe. Ideally, it is within the family that individuals learn how to live well and become good members of the wider community. Moral duty involves deep reverence for one's parents and worship of ancestors. You need to understand your place in the scheme of things. Honor your elders, especially those who brought you into the world, and honor those who brought them into the world, and those who brought them into the world, and so on. Living well, then, is not just about how you treat the living. It's also about how you show respect to the dead. Traditionally, when a parent dies, a son or daughter spends three years in ritual mourning. This period mirrors the three years when the child was completely dependent on parental care. Ancestors' names and lineage are recorded on special tablets that are hung in the home, and these household shrines are the focus of worship. Underlying all this is a view about social harmony, which comes from recognizing hierarchies and honoring elders. Confucius continues to exert a powerful sway over Chinese culture two and a half thousand years after his death. Though, true to his own philosophy, he said that he wasn't an original thinker, but owed his own ideas to the wisdom of those who preceded him. Okay, so you can see uh, from Crespi's perspective how Confucianism would easily fit within his understanding of religion because it's about worshiping ancestors and the goal is social harmony. And you can see how that fits uh, with his understanding of um, it being a device to promote uh, cooperation. All right, you could also look at um, Judaism. Judaism is an older religion, right? Um, relative to say Christianity and Islam. It's more, I think you could make the argument that it's consequently um, more tied to a certain kind of sense of kinship. In other words, Judaism is a religious practice that's also, uh, but it's also an ethnicity. Um, and so there's a connection there that um, in some other kinds of religions you don't have as much. Um, but I think Crespi would say, well, of course, um, you see your ancestors, Abraham, and the whole kinship network as something that deserves uh, reverence. And um, the way you have uh, reverence for that is you remember um, through different kinds of rituals and worship, uh, the history of your people, of, of what has happened to the Jews, and what God has done for the Jews.
All right, and then just to make clear, the glue that makes this work, um, and Crespi doesn't talk about this a whole lot, but its um, ritual is kind of how religious um, principles hit the ground. Um, so in rituals, you're affirming and strengthening different kinds of relationships. So if you just think about the basic logic of prayer, um, someone is kneeling before God and asking for God's blessings and his endeavors and asking for forgiveness for his sins. But you are placing yourself as a supplicant before the Lord, so to speak. Um, so it's establishing this hierarchical relationship between you and God. Um, back in the day, people would make um, sacrifices to the gods. So it's, you know, instead of eating the fatted lamb themselves, they would sacrifice it um, to the God and the gods would um, smell um, the meat. Uh, but you can see how you're in essence um, having God over for dinner. Um, more uh, recent forms of ritual like communion, um, the priest um, is inviting the parishioners uh, to partake in the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And so you have um, a lot of, uh, the, there's a shared meal that um, talks about um, the shared kinship. Um, when you think about um, worship, especially um, singing, there's evidence that um, music is a tool that evolved over time to help groups bond together for different social purposes. Um, and there's evidence when people are in harmony or when they are marching to the same beat, the, the psychological effects, there's more cooperative and that kind of thing. Um, I heard a psychologist once point out, he's always thought that when people raise their hands um, to God like this, it's, it's very... Um, similar to an infant um, wanting to be picked up, right? So there's this relationship to God the Father. Um, the blessings of children um, is a very common um, ritual. And you think about preaching, the role of preaching. You're taking the Word of God, so to speak, and translating it um, to the um, the congregation. And the way, the power, and the passion that the preacher brings to the task um, is something that uh, makes the faith alive for the, the practitioners. So a um, lot of ways in which ritual does the binding um, functions that um, Crespi is talking about. Okay, and then we're going to move on and talk about some empirical support for the stuff that um, Crespi is talking about. So Crespi's paper obviously is very theoretical, but when you look at the psych literature, there's a wide range of things that um, that line up with that, and in my mind offer um, strong evidence that he's on the right um, right track. Um, okay, so we'll talk about uh, empirical research on the values and morals of religious people. We'll see if that fits. Um, I'll just point out um, that when political scientists are trying to measure authoritarianism. Um, they use this measure that's very focused on people's child rearing values. So that's an interesting parallel. Um, there's genetic research on um, different kinds of ideologies, namely authoritarianism, conservatism, and religiousness. And there's evidence that they all fit um, and are all subsets or reflections of one common underlying moral traditionalism. And there's also patterns of prejudice um, that fit with Crespi's understanding of religion as a tribal or a kinship, um, a parochial kind of um, strategy. Okay, so um, if you're looking at the values of religious people, this is um, Schwartz um, value theory and um, the, the heart kind of of the religious outlook would be here with this conformity and tradition with a good chunk of security and occasionally some benevolence thrown in. Um, and the way the Schwartz uh, model works is if you're high in this thing, then you're going to have positive correlations to the values that are adjacent to it, but you're going to have negative correlations to the things that are across from it. We'll talk about this a little bit more with the next reading, but if you're high in conformity and tradition, you do not like people that are very focused on individual autonomy, 
um, and stimulation. You want them to kind of suppress that individualism and conform to the tradition. Um, and I would also point out that this, this model has been cross-culturally validated, so there's good reason to believe that people in all kinds of different cultures endorse these, um, make the same trade-offs among these sets of values um, as other people. Okay, but the short story here is you should seek tradition and conformity. That's pretty much what Crespi is talking about when he um, talks about the heart of religion. Okay, so um, some empirical research. This one's a little older, 2004, um, looking at a, a meta-analysis of a bunch of different um, studies. Um, they found that when you look at what religious people are like, um, and this is interesting up here, we have both Catholics, um, Catholic Muslims and Jews. So it's a little, um, little Western, so to speak. But um, it's interesting that there's a very similar pattern in an endorsement of values. So either Jews, Catholics, or Muslims, um, there's this strong support for tradition and conformity, a little bit um, also for sec um, security. Um, and then there's negative correlations with self-direction, university, universalism, and stimulation. So here you can see that's zero, right? So the stuff down here is stuff that they're less, they, they reject this stuff, and then they endorse this stuff. All right, and then there's also evidence that the religious morality is coalitional. So this is a more recent study, 2020. Um, they're looking at 45 different studies that used either Schwartz values theory or moral foundations theory. And moral foundations theory, just a quick um, snapshot here, um, care, fairness, loyalty, respect for authority, and purity are the five different domains that that identifies. And sure enough, religious people are inclined to endorse uh, loyalty and authority, especially purity, which has to do with um, sex values and chastity and the like. Um, and then down here, more stuff with Schwartz. Again, we see the tradition and the conformity being high, but not universalism. So, they conclude that religiosity is a more restrictive morality. There's this endorsement of social order, self-control, and purity. Um, care is not a, a central value of the religious orientation, which fits more the, the Crespi uh, perspective. Um, it's about duty and um, conformity. Um, spirituality, which is correlated but distinct from religiosity um, you see you do see a more extended morality with that you see um, more um, universalism um, but the bottom line is religious morality contains some coalitional elements some us versus them sorts of things all right and then another point here is that if you look at the political science literature one of the, the key measures of authoritarianism is just looking at people's beliefs about child rearing. Um, and there's other measures, but this one has the advantage of being unobtrusive and it's not really about anything political. So it's nice because then you can see if it does predict some political values and not have any conflation of the two. So respondents are given choices. Uh, there's four different sets of choices they have to make, and I've outlined here in green the ones that would um, give them a point towards being more authoritarian. So the respect for elders, obedience, good manners, and well-behaved are the ideals for children. So the takeaway here is that um, this is an independent group that is seeing obedience of children as being kind of the core function of authoritarianism. Uh, which is closely related to that religiosity view that Crespi is talking about. And so just they weren't drawing on any of that literature. So this is another group coming at a very, very similar kind of topic and, and reaching a similar kind of uh, conclusion. Um, and then there's also some genetic research that does something similar. So um, these researchers were looking at these three things, authoritarianism, 
conservatism and religiousness. And they want to see if they're all part of the same thing or if they're all three distinct things. And they're testing a model where they're all reflecting this one thing, which is this traditional moral values. And the conclusion they reach is that um, all of these, those three different things, all hinge back to obedience to traditional authority. So there's differences between conservatism and religiousness and authoritarianism, but from a genetic perspective, they're pretty closely linked in that there's this one underlying trait that explains 44% of the, the variance, so almost half. Um, so the key takeaway here is um, this fits well with Crispy, Crespi in that you're saying obedience is kind of the chief core value um, that's holding this kind of worldview, that kind of strategy together. All right. And then also a little bit of the, the dark side is there's, and I just have one study here, but there's a number of studies that point out that religion tends to increase prejudice. So what they do here is they prime people either to think, um, they either have a religious prime or a neutral prime, and then they get this reaction to um, different kinds of groups. Um, I think it was atheists, Muslims, and gay men, and this one is Muslims. But you can see here there's more negative reaction um, to Muslims when you get the religious prime versus a neutral prime. So their takeaway here is um, it's not just in-group favoritism. It's not just that religious people, when you prime them to think religiously, are more inclined to be cooperative with their group. There's also this out-group derogation, groups that violate the standards of that moral group or practice a different religion or anything like that, that there's um, um, a, a, a bias against those. So again, there's this evidence that religion is, is performing that coalitional function um, that Crespi is talking about. In other words, it's um, an us versus them. It's uh, um, strengthening this group so it can compete better with other groups. Okay, so some key takeaways from Crespi in the, uh, the lecture here. Um, so parent-offspring conflict presents this opportunity for parents and ancestors. Um, it's, it's based on just differences in um, genetics, um, and there's just basic game theory saying that um, you can see that there's an opportunity for parents to maximize their fitness by manipulating offspring. So you see parents and elders manipulating offspring to overcommit, to be over cooperative, to over invest in kin. And then um, that establishes, they also establish these traditions where you have obedience to elders and you're not supposed to question, you're supposed to conform to obedience. And um, it's self perpetuating. So you find this in all. Uh, traditional societies and what Cohen Palmer are saying and, and Crespi would agree with is that that's it's it's um, constitutional it's one of the it's constituent of those kind of societies that they have those kinds of moralities and what's interesting is it's still with us so we'll talk a bit about here in a few weeks about how uh, in the West um, there's been things that have underlined undermined our kinship networks and we have a different psychology as a result but you still see a good um, amount of authoritarianism, um, a good amount of social conservatism and different kinds of uh, things that are expressed and um, respect for traditions. There's um, a certain valoration of the uh, valorization of the founding fathers and the constitution that, that go beyond just those things in terms of functional elements in our society. The constitution and founding fathers get a kind of a religious halo effect where people that may never have even read the constitution still say that the constitution is really important and defines who we are. And then uh, obviously um, in religiosity, you'll still see um, a strong commitment, especially in America, um, tend to be a very um, religious people. And so you, so we still see those, um, those things um, having an influence. So just a quick um, side note here on, on values. So just because 
Crespi is saying there's this conflict between parents and offspring that doesn't say to what extent we should back one versus the other. So some folks, um, I think when you look at them, they're more inclined to be non-traditional and non-conformist. And there's other folks that the way they were brought up and the way they still live is they're fairly traditional and they're fairly happy with um, the values that their parents instilled in them and all that. So um, I would say, you know, you can look at it. It's there's a distribution of values where people are more traditional or less traditional. And I and no other evolutionist would would say where on here is the appropriate place to be. Um, but that because of this underlying tension, there's going to be um, some of that that variability. Um, and then obviously, once you're talking about like some of the things that makes religion work well um, for increasing cooperation, um, that's not really stating a position on um, the value of religion today in terms of how it's practiced. So I'll just point out, I think there's a huge range between um, the kind of religion that led to the Ku Klux Klan um, the terrorization of African Americans and other groups. And then on the other side, um, you have the civil rights movement that was largely um, supported by and came out of the black church. So uh, there are lots of diversity there and those that and those are just Christian religion. So um, not to uh, not to say that the door is closed on the ultimate um, contribution of religion in society. There's um, other ways um, other things we need to consider before we can pass judgment on that. All right. I hope you enjoyed and um, I will see you back here next time. Thank you.